Weather, it's a critical variable that impacts many aspects of our ranches. But what if you could mitigate that risk with a process that would assist in management decisions? Paying attention to these three tiers of precipitation outlooks, the decadal, the yearly through the El Nino, as well as the local precipitation outlook. That was E.J. Rayner, research scientist with USDA Ag Research in Colorado. He and Retta Brueger with Colorado State Extension are my guests today as we discuss an 80-year project on weather cycles and how it correlates to production on ranches and a decision tree tool that can be used to make management decisions on our ranches. It's all here on this episode of the Working Ranch Radio Show. everyone and we welcome you here it's another episode of the working ranch radio show i'm justin mills thanks for joining us here on our program this is episode 80 and i want to make a special note here today because i'm going to refer to it later on that uh, we're going to refer to a white paper uh, that uh, we are basing a lot of our discussion on here today with our guests and uh, we're going to make sure and put in our link on our podcast site the links several links in there that you can get to information that we reference in today's show. So I want to point that out uh, mainly because I know a lot of you folks are listening here on the radio and we appreciate you tuning in here on the radio. But uh, if you want to find some of the links and information that we're going to be talking about here today, be sure to check out our podcast site. And then pretty much if you just search Working Ranch Radio Show in your internet browser or on any podcast platform out there, you will find us and you can get to the, uh, today's show. Like I said, today is episode 80. Now about our guests, as we as I talked about in the opening, uh, E.J. Rayner, who's an ecologist, research animal scientist with USDA Ag Research Service in Fort Collins, Colorado, will be joining us today. He will also be joined by a cohort, sort of, I guess, they're in the same state, uh, Retta Brueger, who is a regional specialist in range management for Colorado State University Extension. Now, she is based on the western slope. Uh, of course, as you know, Fort Collins is on the eastern slope, so they're joining us uh, today to talk about this white paper uh, that was about early early warnings for stocking decisions and utilizing a study that was done over the course of 80 years and looking at weather. And of course, there's a lot of things that we have talked about with our own meteorologist Don Day in regards to weather uh, phenomenons or weather uh, uh, systems that we that we watch to see how that's going to affect our weather in in each of our different regions. And, and of course, as folks are listening here, we got folks from many different regions. And so it's going to be there's there's uh, going to be things that we'll need to you'll want to adapt to your particular region but i think the template and the gist of what we're trying to get to today i hope will be useful for folks across uh, across the country as as weather is such a critical issue and affects so much of our industry there's no question about that and speaking of weather as we always do at the very close to the end of our program meteorologist don day will be stopping in as we'll take a look at our long-term weather man it's hard to believe we're already heading into the month of August. Changes are coming. He's going to share those with us when he joins us with a look at our long-term weather. And of course, in just a few moments, the Captain Tim O'Byrne will be in for this week's edition of Tim's Two Cents. Well, this time of the year, I know for some folks, you've probably already done with county fairs. Maybe you're getting ready for state fair or... Maybe you're getting ready for county fair. We still got a ways off before state fair, but this is the time of the year for these kids, for the everything to kind of culminate and come together for them with all of their projects, uh, whether they're static exhibits or whether they're animal exhibits or whether they're horse showing or various things that are out there. And so, I want to encourage you if you have an opportunity to and haven't uh, already attended your local junior livestock sale, be sure to do that and support these 4-H and FFA kids that have worked all year on their projects. It's a sure good way to to support a great cause by supporting them at their junior livestock sale. Right now, a thank you to our sponsors of the Working Ranch Radio Show, Galvey and Balancer, the smart, reliable, and profitable choice. For more information, go to their website at galvey.org. Zoetis, it's the little things that could derail progress, but your herd can be covered. Visit getlessparasites.com for solutions from Zoetis. And finally, the American Akaushi Association experience the difference 
at akaushi.com. Well, right now, let's check in, as we always do each and every week, with the captain, Tim O'Byrne, publisher and editor of Working Ranch Magazine, who is madly and fiercely working on the next issue for Working Ranch Magazine. Let's check in with him now for this week's edition of Tim's Two Cents. Hey, Justin, we are really excited to be putting together our September-October issue of the Working Ranch Magazine. I like this issue every year because it's got the Cattle Care Catalog as a special section in, in the book. And we've broken it down into four charts. Nutrition, that's minerals and supplements and that sort of thing. Prevention, that's vaccines. Treatment, that's antibiotics. And comfort and positive growth. So that's stuff like ionophores and parasite control. And we're trying to help you match the product and the company, the manufacturer, the administration method, uh, the, you know, what offerings that they have with what this product can help us do. For example, in prevention, uh, we start off the first column on the left is what are we looking to prevent against? And we got IBR, PI3, BRSV as an example. Then we have a product. Then we have a company name, the manufacturer, who manufactured it. And then more info about it. Is it a modified log? What is it? And then the administration method sub Q. So each of these four charts helps you recognize a problem that you're trying to work with and suggests a product that you can use and then a little bit more information about that product. It's all right there in the cattle care catalog. Every year we keep it updated. And this year you're gonna be able to go online on our digital issue on workingranchmag.com and you're gonna be able to click on the live link on each cattle care catalog product. It's gonna take you right there. Back to you in the booth, Justin. All right, thanks, Captain. And yeah, we are all looking forward to that next issue coming out, the September-October issue. Now, if uh, if you're a longtime subscriber to Working Ranch Magazine, I I know I've been. Shoot, I think I my subscription I believe started in around 2007 or eight. I just don't remember quite offhand, but I do know that in every issue that it is always packed full of great and useful information in there and some interesting stories that uh, are very relevant to all of us here in the ranching industry. So. That is something you can count on, as the captain was sharing with us some of the upcoming uh, stories and features that will be in this next issue. But again, the other bonus part of that is because it's a nice looking magazine as well. And the artwork, the pictures, the photography is always just top of the line. And I got to tell you, had an opportunity to take a sneak peek at the cover of the September, October issue coming out. And I will just tell you right now, it does not disappoint either. So like the captain said, if you do not have your subscription, you can go online at workingranchmag.com. You can get a subscription started there uh, for print, or you can also get started on a digital uh, subscription with Working Ranch Magazine. Be sure to check that out. Well, stay with us. When we come back, we're going to get into our featured topic for today's show how long-term forecasts can help with stocking decisions we'll get into that when we come back on the working ranch radio show For commercial cow-calf producers, crossbreeding with Galvay and Balancer is the smart, reliable, and profitable choice. Galvay and Balancer females offer maternal superiority through increased fertility, greater longevity, and more pounds of calf weaned per cow exposed. In the feed yard, Balancer cattle can offer increased performance, improve feed efficiency, and have excellent carcass merit. Balancers add the pounds, make the grade, and deliver the value. Gelby and Balancer, the smart, reliable, and profitable choice. For more information, go to gelby.org. And we welcome you back here to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm your host, Justin Mills. Glad to have you here on our program today. A a topic that we're going to be covering, as we said in our opening, that I think has a lot of of usefulness to us here in the ranching industry and that is as uh, is there ways that we can look at some of this the the previous weather that are that we've seen throughout the country in the you know many years back and using that to forecast ahead of when droughts are going to be so that we can make good management decisions and joining us on our program today to talk more about that i've got ej rayner who's an ecologist and research animal scientist with the usda ag research service out of fort collins colorado and also red Bruger, a regional specialist in range management for CSU Extension, that she is based out on the west side of Colorado. So both of you, thanks for joining us here today on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us, Justin. 
Uh, I want to start first by by setting this up because we're going to get into a study that you uh, that EJ that I know you have uh, have done on this. And we're going to talk more about it later, but let's first set this up because, as I said just a moment ago, we do and are starting to accumulate more and more data about our weather. And I believe that was something that you saw that said, man, okay, we've got this data, then how do we use that? So let's start that way and talk about what you were seeing as you, as you saw some real value in the data that, we're, that we've been able to accumulate in the country that gives us this ability. Yeah. Uh, thanks again for this opportunity, Justin. Uh, so this work... Uh, providing early warning signs for stocking decisions in the eastern plains of Colorado or the short grass steppe where you have a blue grama dominated range, um, really hails from uh, some work going on in Fort Collins and Cheyenne, Wyoming, led by uh, Justin Derner at the Rangeland Resources and Systems Research Unit. And this work really takes into account about 80 years of livestock weight gain or yearling steer weight gain data, um, which be data collection, which began in, in 1939 in Nunn, Colorado, where rangeland managers working for the Forest Service at the time before the station became a property of the Agricultural Research Service, uh, were really trying to answer the question of how can we utilize animal agricultural in this land that had recently experienced a pretty severe problem in the in the role of the the dust bowl where row crop agriculture was deemed to be inadequate for providing income to ranch to families in this region so the government put together some grazing intensity studies using light moderate and heavy stock pasture to understand the role of grazing intensity across those three different stocking levels in providing uh, weight gain or beef on this landscape. The outcome that is delivered in in some of our work is relative to moderate stocking, where in our pastures, which are about half section pastures, 320 uh, acre pastures stocked with about uh, 15 to 20 head in moderate stock pasture, yearling steers, 10 head in light stock pasture and around 25 to 35 in heavy stock pasture, depending on the year, um, really informs us how to use uh, climate modes, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is a large scale uh, climate driver driven by sea surface temperature anomalies in the Northern Pacific Ocean. And this flips from a cold to a warm phase every 15 to 30 years and when you're in a warm phase this is can be seen like a bathtub carrying uh, warm water so steam is being able to be carried eastward with the uh, jet stream to provide uh, precipitation for forage production now when that is interacting with an el nino year which is el nino southern oscillation Mm -hmm. something that occurs down in the equator and it flips from warm to cold every one to three years. When both you're a warm PDO and a, a warm El Nino, you have a higher stability of forage production from year to year. Whereas if you are in a cold El Nino, which is called a La Nina, this is when precipitation variability is, is high. And, and then you really need to mind how many head you stock early in the grazing season. And we'll elaborate on that further. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to set up this uh, experiment that has been going on since 1939 and and give you an understanding of how we're using these management strategies to inform stocking decisions in the short grass step. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the the other thing, and and we've had lots of discussion with uh, meteorologist Don Day that joins us at the end of every program, gives us a long-term weather update. And we've had also just some shows with him where we've talked about some of the patterns of weather that we've seen. And and that was something that, you know, we've talked about here on the show that really you really see some relevance that I, at this point in time, you've got a study here. Now it's a matter of we really need to dive into this and then begin to use this reference, this data that you have in order to make it work. Yes, exactly. And we were 
a, lucky enough to work with researchers at Colorado State University, Bill Parton, a climatologist or climate expert, and where he had been looking at forage production in relation to these large scale climate modes. And we took it to the next step, looking at secondary production or animal mm -hmm. weight gain. And that's how this, this project really began. Mm -hmm. And luckily, we had 80 years of data to work with in yeah. light, moderate, and heavy stock pasture. Mm -hmm. As you've looked at the data in the past, as we look forward to, you know, look ahead in, in this, is there a continuation with this to, to try to gather, continue to gather more data and have more, I guess, solidify what this study is? Currently, um, this study is ongoing in, in Nunn, Colorado, and we're gathering data sets across the central and, and northern Great Plains, looking at similar patterns with precipitation and something that is an ongoing project. Mm -hmm. This study is being done mostly in, in Colorado, but for folks that are not necessarily in that area, there is relevance, though, no matter what area you're in. And so talk about, you know, outside of the Colorado or southern Wyoming, where this study has been done, how this is relevant to folks in any part of the country. Yeah, this study is, is quite relevant in terms of understanding these climate modes and the information about the climate modes and when they change is, is available through the uh, NOAA website, so the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association's website. And these patterns have different influences on forage production depending where you are in the country. The Pacific Northwest and the Northern Great Plains might act a little bit differently than here in the Central Great Plains on how forage uh, production stability or variability is mediated by those large-scale climate modes in the Pacific Ocean. But this gives you a real um, initial step to understanding how to use such climate information or weather information that is available both on the NOAA website and El Nino, which you hear about from the local weatherman every spring, is yeah. something you also have to keep track of yeah. uh, through more local means. Mm -hmm. Red, I want to go to you real quick because as a, as an extension uh, specialist on the western slope of Colorado, and and I don't know if folks are, I'm sure a lot of folks are probably somewhat uh, understanding of Colorado. It's very diverse in terms of the the climates that are in that state, with the Rocky Mountains coming down the center and creating uh, different signs of climates depending on the side of the mountains you're on. You're there in the western slope of Colorado as you're dealing with producers and, and and landowners in this particular, uh, based upon this particular information coming from here, what have you found useful out of it? Yeah, I think, you know, the reason I, as you say, I'm on the West Slope and not on the Eastern Plains like EJ is, and this research, of course, was done on the Eastern Plains. Um, but I think one of my passions and interest from folks I work with is, you know, planning for drought, better tools to predict and adapt to drought and that kind of thing. So I was really interested in this work. But I think, you know, not everything transfers 100%, but certainly La Nina and El Nino are really significant in the Western Slope. Um, as you say, there's some large differences. And in some ways, we have less information. We don't have a research ranch uh, such that EJ works at on the Western Slope that's been around since 1939. But um, I think any tools that people can have to make an educated uh, bet, essentially, on what foreign conditions might look like, it seems to be useful for folks I work with. So I think uh, this study has application for sure, although I wish that we did have a longer <laughs> and more robust data set that I could draw on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, my guest today is E.J. Rayner, who is Ecologist Research Animal Scientist with USDA Research Service out of Fort Collins, Colorado, and also Retta Brueger, who is uh, with the CSU Extension over on the western side of, the, of Colorado. We're talking today about early warnings for stock decisions and how that can be useful on, on a ranch operation. We've got more to come. We'll continue when we come back on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Control comes when you focus on the little things, from daily chores to parasite management, because any little thing could derail progress. But your herd can be covered. Visit GetLessParasites.com for solutions from Zoetis. Zoetis. 
And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. I'm joined today by E.J. Rayner, Retta Brueger. They are uh, both uh, with a uh, white paper that came out in regards to early warnings for stocking decisions and utilizing some of the weather data. Now, this was a study done in uh, on the plains of eastern plains of Colorado and in, up into Wyoming. However, there is some relevant uh, usefulness to just the concept in general as we apply this to ranching all across the country here. And E.J., I want to go to you now because in, in this there was kind of a decision tree that you put up that basically we could take what are we you know the data that we have right now and place that into a process that would help us to go down through that and you know one of the things i i didn't mention early on that uh, was important is you know do we have a drought plan do, do us as ranchers on your operation do you have a drought plan because this decision tree can be implement can help you in implementing that so let's talk about that process and and, and how that would work Yeah, Justin. So we developed a decision support tool in the form of a decision tree using about 80 years of livestock or yearling steer weight gain data at the Central Plains Experimental Range near Nunn, Colorado. And within this eight decade data set, we had a handful of of drought years and a handful of, of really good precipitation years, and then many average years. And Within that data set, uh, animals were stocked at light, moderate, and heavy across the same pastures each year with season-long grazing uh, management strategies. Now, this decision tree operates on three time periods or time temporal scales. So you have the Pacific Decadal Oscillation phase, which is either cold or warm, and that depends on the, the sea surface temperature in the North Pacific for the decade that you are of, are interested in. Mm-hmm. So currently, we are in a warm phase PDO, whereas in the, during the 2012 drought, for instance, that was the end of a cold phase PDO for Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Okay. And then the next temporal period or, or tier of interest is something that changes not on the 10 to 30 year cycle like the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, but the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which changes from cold to warm every one to three years. And then you also have local precipitation amount, which is provided with pretty good skill or accuracy in three months in advance through uh, local weather outlets. Now, taking these three different time periods or scales of precipitation, you can have an idea of reducing the uncertainty and making a bad decision in in decreasing the amount of head stocked in a pasture relative to a moderate stocking rate or increasing. Mm -hmm. And for instance, in 2012, as I said earlier, this was during a cold PDO phase, and this happen to also be occurring in a La Nina year. Mm -hmm. And if we knew about this decision tree in advance, we would have realized that reducing the number of head on our research station would have been a good idea in relation to uh, economic outcomes and and weight gain realities on the station. And for instance, this year, 2022, which is during a warm phase phase, PDO, but also a La Nina, we we did realize that La Nina might have a negative effect on the outcomes at the end of the season because we had developed this decision support tool back in 2019. And we purchased a less amount of animals that year. We stocked lower than usual in 2022, and and we were thankful that we did because we're about to reduce the, Mm -hmm. the number of animals on the landscape from about 700 head to to zero this year. And that's because we knew we were in a La Nina, and that likely is going to mean lower precipitation availability in the spring, which promotes about 70% of the forage produced on the landscape each year at our research station. Now, if we were going into a neutral El Nino Southern Oscillation, which has occurred more recently, then we would really pay attention to what the local weatherman was was forecasting in terms of local precipitation being average, above average, or below average. And if it was predicted to be average, we can maintain a moderate stocking. 
and likely realize um, positive outcomes in weight gain at the end of the season. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I would run through the decision tree that we were talking about. And we could provide you a link to this decision tree uh, through the Colorado State University website, Mm -hmm. um, if you would like. Yeah. But one thing we're 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 learning is that in years that end with two, it, it seems to be the years that droughts are likely going to occur. So 2022, 2012, 2002, those are all years where it seems to um, coincide with low precipitation and when a um, lower number of animals might want to be purchased before the beginning of a grazing season. Mm-hmm. So we're able to look back and we can and we can see how this lines up with previous weather cycles. And now let's let's take let's move let's look ahead if we can and, and we've already identified that we're in a warm oscillation a La Nina year and and that of course that kind of predicts where to go. As you look ahead, what do you see? I guess like what's the next phase look like as we move forward? The paying attention to winter precipitation levels up to April is essential for understanding how much of those cool season grasses are going to be produced in the next spring for forage. And another aspect of this study that I hadn't mentioned is previous years when there was quite a large amount of forage production and there's quite a bit of of forage held over into the next year where that forage is going to be quite high availability, but of low quality. That might be something you also need to take into account. And the way that one can use these indices that are available on the internet is if La Nina or El Nino is occurring outside of a neutral phase is when that sea surface temperature anomaly is above a half degree Celsius from the average of that large scale climate mode. And so La Nina, it's a half a degree Celsius on average for four months continuously in the winter, that tells you you're in a La Nina. Mm-hmm. A half a degree positive above the mean index, that's when you are heading towards the El Nino and you likely could realize more than a few more head than your moderate stocking rate. And linking all of these pieces together entails looking at this decision support tool, this decision tree, as well as the phase of the El Nino that you are going into, into the early spring, late winter, a part of the year of interest. Mm -hmm. I asked this in the in the previous segment too about just relations to other parts of the country because I know as as this study was done in the eastern slopes of Colorado it, there is a lot of specificity to that particular region that we're talking about here today and and I guess if you know when I, when we have folks listening across the country you know we got folks down in the south central part of the country that are really dr- droughty we've got folks up in the northern tier of the country uh, that have seen a little bit more moisture what I got from this as I was reading this is there are patterns that that you can go back and you can match this decision tree up very similar and some of that might be a little bit different based upon certain regions I mean would that be fair to say that I mean I could see this being very applicable to the north to the eastern plains Mm -hmm. but uh, maybe you know maybe north uh, further north up into the Dakotas and Montana and in Washington that final decision thing could be a little bit different is that fair to say? Yes, I yeah. would say yeah. you're correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And maybe I, I would just add there too, EJ alluded to this earlier, but in the northwest part of the U.S. can be favored by La Nina conditions. And we, we do see that this year. Mm-hmm. So it's almost the opposite of what we experience here in terms of La Nina bodes dry for Colorado, but it can bode more moisture for the Northwest. So yeah, I would really encourage folks to calibrate with their own region. And you mentioned Western Colorado earlier, and this study is applicable, but not as applicable Mm -hmm. to Western Colorado. So what I always encourage people to do is examine their own experience. You know, we might not have 80 years of hand collected data, but you might have 80 years of people, you know, who've managed the land and you can draw from that. So Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, often ask people to reflect upon their knowledge. And and it is amazing what people have observed um, in the absence of 
being able to have 80 years of um, livestock weight gain correlated with the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. There's other sources you can go to. Yeah. I want to continue more. We're going to take a break right here because I want to talk a little bit more about that, about transferring that information over because I think that's a key part of this and, and finding that data that is relevant to your region. There's the, the To me, what I saw in this paper was that the template, the frame of it is applicable to anywhere in the country. It's now we got to put that down into what, you know, how these certain trends affect our region and like what we were just talking about. But I want to talk about more when we come back about this transfer, because there's really important element to that that can help this process in making good decisions when it comes to stocking and, and managing our ranching operations. My guest today is E.J. Rayner and Retta Brueger. Uh, they are both out of Colorado State. Uh, E.J. is with the USDA Ag Research Service and Retta is with CSU Extension. We're talking about making using weather for forecasts uh, for making stocking decisions on your ranching operations we're going to continue when we come back on the working ranch radio show at the american akaushi association we're more than prime the american akaushi association was created to help ranchers be more profitable and find opportunities when using akaushi genetics in their herd we focus on market opportunities for our members and offer support from conception to consumer when you choose Akaushi, you have a network right there with you. Experience the difference at Akaushi.com. That's A-K-A-U-S-H-I dot com. And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. My guest today, E.J. Rayner, Retta Brueger. They are both uh, with a, uh, a part of a, a paper, a white paper that came out in regards to uh, the title of it was Early Warning for Stocking Decisions. Now, their, their study was based out of eastern Colorado, but we've talk, been talking about that study. And I want to get into a little bit more about the applicability for folks all across the country. When I was researching this to visit with you two, there was a, a line that kept coming into my head and that was you can't control the weather but you can control how it impacts your business and I feel that is really the the ultimate underlying theme in this topic here today that we're trying to get at and that is the, here's a study done in eastern Colorado however there is relevance to folks across the country we can take this decision tree that you have and and they're at that very third thing, uh, third line of that, and we can make those arrows shift to what's relevant to your area. And I really think that this is this is something that has applicability to anybody in in across the country. And uh, Red, I want to go to you because really this is a tool to be used from a management standpoint. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I'm of course on the western slope, but the reason I was really interested in EJ's research was because it helped me in communication with producers I work with and, and their interests as well to have tools that can help reduce the risk of decisions in drought. And, um, you know, one thing we talk a lot about is hoping for rain is not a drought strategy. I do it all the time. I hit refresh on my phone, but that's not a strategy that actually prepares you more for drought. So this tool, you know, regardless of where you are, maybe the tool itself isn't exactly applicable but the the theme i think is which is if you know the critical periods for when forage production occurs so when you need to get that precipitation for, for the maximum forage production to occur you don't have to wait until august to realize it's a drought you don't have to wait until august to know you don't have enough forage you can get some early warning so that was really my personal interest in this, uh, putting together this white paper with EJ and helping him get his research out there um, is because it really can inform, it, it's one tool in the toolbox for perhaps mm -hmm. making some better decisions. With that said, it's a risk reduction strategy, but it's not a risk elimination strategy, right? We can never eliminate risk. Um, I think in the research that they found was combining the Pacific Decadal Oscillation with El Nino and La Nina, they could predict about 70% of weight gain over the 80-year period. So they could use those tools to predict 70% of weight gain, but there's a 30% that they fail to predict. So I think that's also important to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. It's a risk reduction strategy, but it's not 100%. There's still, as we all know, unpredictability in weather that we experience, but it can just help you 
calibrate your decisions a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And uh, folks, I keep referring to this the this white paper on that, and we will put a link if you're on uh, able to listen or go to our podcast site in the description. We will put a link to this because you're going to see uh, not only the the article in general, but also this decision tree that EJ's been referring to, that I've been referring to in this, and how really as this was designed for what their study that they did there. But EJ, as you and I were talking and read it at the break there, we were talking about really, you know, the first two tiers of that are going to be the same for folks, for the most part, maybe difference in certain areas of the country. Uh, but this is how it can be used as a template across the country. Right. And for example, La Nina in the Pacific Northwest might mean increase the number of head relative to a moderate stocking rate if you are going into a La Nina uh, spring or, or early winter. And so all the information used in our decision tool is, is weather information leading up to April of the grazing season of interest. So mm-hmm. of April 2018, predicting weight gain of summer 2018. Mm-hmm. But that type of information transfers geographically to different locations in the country. And so Pacific Northwest, La Nina is not as detrimental as it is in the central Great Plains to forage production. Mm-hmm. Retta, you'd mentioned this, and, and we we talked about it a little bit ago about having a drought plan. EJ, you just referred to a date of a time frame of the year that was ki- kind of a deadline, really, in, a, in a, a lot of ways, that being April. Let's talk a little bit more about that and why that is that deadline to really hold, you know, really be that management uh, decision. And so that that deadline comes from the fact that our research station is really a um, region that reacts to the amount of precipitation that occurs in the winter, really drives some cool season grasses, such as western wheatgrass and and needle and thread. So 70% of the total production for that summer is driven by the amount of spring precipitation. And that's what we're factoring in in our analyses in this project. Mm -hmm. And there again, there would be a time frame that could be a little bit different based upon the the area of the country in, maybe a little bit further south. That date could be a little bit earlier. If you're a little bit further north, could be a tad later than that. Would that be safe to assume? Yes, for Mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. And definitely further north you go into the northern Great Plains, that time window changes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And it would change to just as a note in terms of what drives your system, you know, so is it snow melt like we have here on the Western slope? So that's something to consider as well. And I think, yeah, the, the exact date likely shifts, but mm-hmm. I think the concept is still sound in terms of when precipitation comes really contributes or matters in terms of total production. One of the things that uh, we were talking about before we went to break was just passing this information down to the next management uh, generation. And sometimes that's that's maybe the son taking over for the dad, or or maybe it's a complete new ranch manager coming in to the ranch to manage. And that that is an element there that, for example, you know, my dad uh, ranched through the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, you know, as he was at high school in the 50s. But there was time frames, there were situations that happened then that, you know, as he passed away, I didn't experience that. And he didn't necessarily tell me, okay, this is what we did in 1982. And so that that in itself is a big issue that we in the ranching industry really need to probably be journaling and taking good notes for our own operations. Yes, yeah. exactly. So as these decadal, these phases from cold to warm with the Pacific decadal oscillation change on a 10 to 30 year cycle, if you're if a family member, for instance, managing that property is not managing. So as we said, a grandfather to a father and then to a a son or a daughter in the current decade that we're in, say that father did not uh, manage that property during a cold phase PDO. They were not accustomed to dealing with high precipitation variability and what that means for drought. And so that generational Um, transfer of knowledge is really important and and that institutional knowledge transfer is what we're we're talking about here. And so using this decision tree could actually potentially fill in that gap if you uh, did lose some of that institutional knowledge on your property. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's a good point. We're about to wrap up here, and I want to give you each an opportunity to kind of just say some final comments. And uh, Retta, let's go with you first. And as you came onto this project as a way of getting this information out, you saw the relevance to uh, to the ranching industry and, and thought it was important that we, we get this information out. Baseline, what do you feel is really important regarding this topic for you? So I think the the biggest thing about this work in this paper is using all the tools available to folks to make the best decisions they can about grazing and stocking decisions um, going into the grazing season. So I think the biggest thing is, you know, maybe the details don't transfer as we've discussed, but, you know, really looking at the bigger cycles, La Nina El Nino is significant for the Western Slope local precipitation, and then, you know, asking your parents, grandparents, and trying to document some of that knowledge that they have so that you can make good decisions about stocking rate. Mm -hmm. EJ, I'll let you have the final comment here today. I know this was a study you put a lot of time and effort into. It continues on today, as you were mentioning earlier. As we head out here, just some final comments from you as, as far as the real takeaway that you want folks to pull out of the research data that you have. The big takeaway is knowing what Pacific decadal phase you are currently occupying. And and this, you know, does not change on a more yearly cycle like the El Nino. Southern oscillation changes from a La Nina to a neutral where you're not realizing the benefits of, of sea surface temperatures on the equator. And when you are in a neutral phase, that means really paying attention to the predictions locally in regards to precipitation are what matter. So when you're not in a cold or warm phase PDO, you could be in a neutral phase and that might impact what kind of El Nino or La Nina that you might occur. So paying attention to these three tiers of precipitation outlooks, the decadal, the yearly through the El Nino, as well as the local precipitation outlook, which occurs on a three-month basis through tools like GrassCast, a forage production predict forecaster for the Great Plains in the southwest in the United States is another tool one could use. So taking all these into account is a a key to reducing uncertainty and making stocking decisions on your your enterprise. Mm -hmm. Well, as we were talking before the break, it's by no means a silver bullet, but it is a management. It's a way to uh, alleviate some risk or eliminate more risk that's out there when it comes to our weather, as we all are all very subject to our to our weather here when it comes to agriculture. EJ and Retta, I appreciate you guys joining us here on the Working Ranch Radio Show to talk about this topic that I believe is, boy, it's it's very relevant to us in agriculture. Well, thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. If you have any questions, let us know. You bet. And folks, like I said before, we will put a link to this that you can go and download this paper and look at the the, re- the, the information that they've put out. It'll be in the description of our on our podcast uh, site as well. And so you can just click on that link and it'll you'll be able to download that paper and take a look for yourself. Again, thanks to you guys for joining us here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. As we've been talking about weather, well, we're going to talk weather more as meteorologist Don Day joins us in our next segment with a look at our long-term weather. We'll be back on the Working Ranch Radio Show after this. Do you have a young child, grandchild, niece, or nephew that loves the weather and wants to learn more? Day Weather has produced a children's weather journal full of weather facts, fun weather experiments, coloring pages, and pages to record weather observations for every season of the year. The weather journal is for ages 3 to 7 and designed to be fun and educational. The interactive weather projects are fun for the whole family to take part in. For only $10, the Day Weather Weather Journal is a great gift idea for any occasion. Click on our Amazon link to order at dayweather.com. Ranching has been in the Hardgrove family for generations, and they know the value of keeping a ranch in the family. Hardgrove Ranch Insurance provides pasture, range, and forage insurance to ranchers across the nation. PRF Insurance is a USDA subsidized program that allows ranchers to insure against the risk of below average rainfall. Hardgrove Ranch Insurance utilizes industry-leading custom software to provide the rancher with information they need to stay up to date and educated on their policy throughout the year. 
Hargrove Ranch Insurance supports ranchers for this generation, the next, and those yet to come. Contact Hargrove Ranch Insurance at 325-573-8975 for a free custom quote or online at hargroveinsurance.com. And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. We're joined now by meteorologist Don Day with a look at our long-term weather. And Don, before we get into that, uh, you and I have talked previously here on the show, and and we've and I, you know, that uh, I keep track of 90-day fog forecasting. And so I thought it was interesting because last week uh, I did have a fog weather event, and you also had pretty significant fog. You're based out of Cheyenne, Wyoming, and so I didn't know if you wrote that down so that 90 days out from now you could show maybe maybe gauge that yourself well yeah i mean it's 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 interesting um one of these days i'm gonna spend some time and put a lot of research into if there's anything to this 90 day fog thing i know there's a lot of (laughs) folks you included that really think there is something to it and they're very well made but when you get uh major weather events to come through uh the type that can produce uh cooler moist weather to where you get these areas of fog you know it is an indication of of uh, a pattern shift that sometimes uh does result in maybe something down the road and it's always a good thing though if you have a fog event that usually means you've got some precipitation or you're likely going to be getting some more Mm -hmm. well and that kind of ties into really our long-term forecasting because it does look like we're going to see some moisture starting to develop as that monsoon moisture coming in and and uh, of course the western part of the of the country uh, of washington and and oregon and down the coast and and into the four corners area seeing significant moisture and then that kind of rolling through that kansas oklahoma border area as well it looks like yeah, and, and one thing uh, to point out is it's we're kind of seeing the monsoon moisture getting into its mature stage where it tends to get a little deeper and sometimes can get a little bit further into the United States. And it's also being aided by a natural flow of Gulf of Mexico moisture coming into the region. So it's not just that uh, Baja of California off the west coast of Mexico feeding things, but the Gulf as well. And one thing that's been really missing in the news, because the news is being dominated by, well, it's hot in Washington and Oregon and California and the southeastern United States, which we know about. But no one's talking about the coolness that's moving to the central and northern plains. And what's what is really important about that is that, number one, it's giving some parts of the central United States a little bit of a break from the heat. Not everybody. Those southern areas of Texas are still not getting into the cool, but a boundary of that cooler air up against that hotter air and that moisture we produced six to 12 inches of rain in parts of Missouri and far eastern Kansas this week. And there's a concentrated band where these air masses are kind of meeting and the monsoon is also joining that area. So we're going to continue to see, especially long I-70, Interstate 70 from Colorado through Kansas into Missouri and parts of northern Oklahoma Uh, And this could also get into southern areas of Nebraska, could see really significant rain over the next seven to 10 days because of that battle between the cooler air that's settling into the central plains and that warm, moist air coming up from the south. Mm -hmm. And another area, we talked about it last week, but another area that is really seeing significant moisture now in this part of the year is Canada. Yeah, there will be in the coming week or two ahead, several weather systems coming off the Pacific across the central and southern portions of Canada. That's going to lead to a cooler than wetter than normal pattern for just about all the provinces uh, from British Columbia through Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. Uh, I think it's going to be the central and northern areas of those uh, provinces are going to see the, the most precipitation. And we've been talking about, we just mentioned how hot it is in Washington, Oregon, and central and northern California. But this heat wave that they're experiencing now is transient. It's going to not stick because the high is going to move back into the central United States next week. So they'll get relief from the heat and probably some precipitation as well for some of those Pacific Northwest areas. All right. Well, we've been able to cover most of the country, so I appreciate you joining us here uh, as we take a look at our long-term weather forecast. 
Thanks for having me. And again, that was meteorologist Don Day with a look at our long-term weather as he joins us in every show uh, towards the tail end as we get a look at our long-term weather. Now, if you're interested in kind of what he's doing throughout the week and what he's pre- predicting throughout the week, I invite you to go to his website at dayweather.com and there will be a link to his uh, daily video podcast or you can just go to YouTube as well and catch it there. Also on his website, if there's things you're looking for like weather stations or some other miscellaneous things, check out what he's got uh, listed on his website as well. Now, speaking of, of Don Day and in conjunction with our program here today and the topic that we were talking about with looking at some of these long-term weather patterns that have happened and how we can put that into context for what we would be looking at today or in the future to help us in making management decisions across the ranch. Now, I've done a couple shows with Don that I would point out to that you can go to our podcast site and pull those shows and take a listen to them. One of them was episode 36. Now, this was back on the 26th of August of 2021, last year. It's going to correlate very close to what we talked about here today. I'd invite you to go back to listen to that. Again, that was episode 36. Also, I want to point out episode 60, which was in March of this year, March 4th. It was a weather outlook for 2022. Now, we did get a bit into 2023 and talking about that, but I think both of those shows that I just referenced here, episode 36 and episode 60 could be useful in helping uh, with also what we talked about here today on our show, especially that episode 36, which really dialed in on very similar conversation that we had today with our guest. We'll stay with us when we come back. We'll put a wrap on this week's show. Living in the country means working in the country. And that calls for a tough tractor. Well, Bobcat has 15 models in its compact tractor lineup from 21 to 58 horsepower. With the help of your local Bobcat dealer, you'll find a perfect match for your property and to-do list. Get a look at all the different models at Bobcat.com. And while you're there, use the Build and Quote tool to design your ideal machine. Get yourself one tough tractor from one tough animal. Bobcat. Visit bobcat.com ka-ching more pounds more calves more profit studies show herford genetics increased net profit by 51 dollars per cow per year that's twenty thousand dollars in additional revenue for a typical 400 cow outfit and calves sired by herford bulls continue to add value through the chain a documented 30 dollars per head in feedlot profitability that's real money and real results get more ka-ching Come home to Hereford at Hereford.org. Well, as we head the horses back towards the barn on this episode of the Working Ranch Radio Show, I want to remind you one more time that I did put as links that you can get to some of the topics and some of the information that we were talking about here today with our guests. Of course, uh, one is the white paper article and that decision tree that we were talking about. Also, the full research paper that was part that kind of details that 80 years of research that EJ was talking about. And then also a couple other links. One is on the Pacific Decadal Oscillation chart and then the fourth link is to Noah's website on El Nino and La Nina information all of that useful as we were talking about in the show that you take that decision tree and we know that in certain regions it's going to be different than their study in the eastern plains of Colorado but nevertheless you can build that decision tree that says okay this year is we're either in a warm or a cold and then we can move down that and it would help us in our management decisions and which is why I felt this topic today was very very useful for us here in ranching Uh, it's information that's not necessarily new but uh, maybe utilizing it the way we are is somewhat new and I think it would be very very useful for a lot of us before I head out of here too I want to also thank my guest today EJ Rayner and Retta Brueger for joining us to talk about this subject a thanks to our sponsors as well Gelvy and Balancer the smart reliable and profitable choice for more information go to their website at gelvy.org 
Zoetis. It's the little things that could derail progress, but your herd can be covered. Visit GetLessParasites.com for solutions from Zoetis. And the American Akaushi Association. Experience the difference at Akaushi.com. The Working Ranch Radio Show is a production of Working Ranch Magazine. If you'd like to get a hold of me, please feel free to send me an email at Justin.WorkingRanch at gmail.com. Be sure to join us right here, same time, same place, or on your podcast provider. I'm Justin. Justin Mills, and until next time, keep your chin down and your mind in the middle. So long.